Hello, and welcome to the Drum History Podcast. I am your host, Bart Vanderzee, and today I'm joined by my friend, Maddie Meyer. And we're going to be talking about the history of traditional country western drummers. Maddie, what's going on, man? Hey, Bart. How you doing? Thanks for having me. Absolutely. This is uh, this is really cool because we've we've talked for a while and have become friends through social media and all that stuff. And just um, I'm pumped to have you on the show because, like a lot of a lot of times, I can say I don't know much about this, but this topic I really don't know much about. Um, not growing up as a, a country <laughs> western guy, so really glad to have you here. Yeah. Well, thanks, man. Yeah, man, I, I love talking about it. So where, where would you want to start? Per usual, um, let's just jump right in with uh, where does country okay. Western drumming begin? And maybe explain the difference between country and Western and, and all that good stuff. Sounds good. Okay, cool. Well, traditional country Western drumming got its start in the dance halls of Oklahoma, Texas, rural Louisiana, New Orleans, the Midwest, California, and even New York City in the late 30s and 40s uh, with Western swing. Cajun music, jazz, and polka. And Western swing is a combination of jazz, traditional string band music, cowboy songs, and polka. And one of the most famous uh, Western swing drummers is Smokey Dacus, who was the first drummer for the Texas Playboys. And even a young young Joe Morello played uh, for the Arkansas Travelers back then. It's basically jazz minus the call and response, uh, a kind of swung polka like um you know picture gene krupa wearing spurs that, that kind of thing <laughs> cool and, <laughs> exactly yeah and cajun music is french canadian folk music uh acadian folk music mixed with american string band music and creole music in louisiana and one of the most famous drummers of this age era of cajun swing drummers was kersey pork chop roy who played with harry schultz and then, of course, you know, you've got jazz drumming that started in New Orleans with the second line and trap drumming at Baby Dodds. So that, that's all that. So yeah. when you combine this, da- this, and that's all dance hall music. So when you combine this dance hall music with the hillbilly string band, country blues and spirituals of the Southeast, like the Carter family, the Johnson brothers, L. Watson, and so on, you get what we now know as country and Western. Uh, not to mention Jimmy Rogers, who recorded with Louis Armstrong, and Emmett Miller, who originally recorded Love Sick Blues in 1925 with drums. Hmm. So, so that's, that's where the term country and Western comes from. You know, uh, the, the, yeah, like the string band music mixed with the dance hall music. Man, that's, yeah. uh, to me, it's something that I, I never really would have put together the jazz. It seems like worlds apart, jazz and sort of the string band uh, era of music. But man, it just goes to show that everything builds off of everything else and uh, everything is influencing all the other different kinds of music. So that's just fascinating. Exactly. Like when you think of, uh, you know, hillbilly string band and old time music, you don't necessarily think of the drums, right? But, you know, the, the rhythms that that, that that music had its own progressive traditions too. So like the rhythms created by the banjos, and flat footing and the bones were later kind of adapted to into country music drumming, sure. you know? Yeah. So yeah, it's really, but you know, but then when you think of Western swing and jazz, you almost always, you know, think of a drum kit, you know? Now what, um, so, what year, like what, what era are we talking about right, right now? Oh, you know, so like this is, you know, this is, we're talking to this earlier part here is, is I guess you could clump in with the Western swing era which, you know, that's the late 30s and, okay. and 40s. Cool. Yeah. But the, the, the truth is the drums have been part of country music tradition like long before the term, you know, country music existed. You know, during the Civil War even, like fife and drum music, you know, military drumming, drumming was used, you know, to move positions on the battlefield as well as entertain troops. But many of the melodies that the fifes would play were adaptations of American and English and Irish folk tunes that we now refer to as old time music and the rudimentary drumming that, you know, went with that music followed the melodies very tightly It followed the rhythm of those, the fifes very tightly. And, you know, that, that rudimentary vocabulary became part of, you know, the syncopated brass bands and second line drumming in New Orleans, you know, which eventually led to the development of the trap kit, you know, so that, so it even like, the tradition of, you know, fife and drum music 
having that old time background, which is such a big part of country music. And then all the rudiments that went with that later inspiring, the, you know, the new Orleans stuff. I mean, that's, that's the big connection right there sure. for the music, but that goes way, that goes way back. <laughs> yeah. It's, it's fascinating to me about how many of these topics kind of go back to military and army uses um, of the style. And yeah. I think that's true with a lot of different, like even technology in the world, a lot of things that you like the internet, everything sure. goes back to like the military. Yeah. Um, it's pretty fascinating, but sure, yeah, it is. It is fascinating. So moving forward then um, yeah. into the thirties with the Western swing kind of feel, where do we go from there? Okay. So like, you know, the, you know, drumming has been part of the music longer than it has not been. And in the early days, uh, there was no such thing as a country drummer. Like I said before, most drummers backgrounds were in jazz, show drumming and polka. So outside of Western swing in the, in the forties, you know, drummers had to make it up as they went along. Drummers like Ferris Corsi, Nashville's first studio drummer. He had to make it up as he went along. Ferris recorded with Red Foley, Hank Williams, Patsy Cline, and even Bill Monroe and the Bluegrass Boys. Now, this is the late 40s into the early 50s. From, you know, from the late 40s and early 50s, drums were kind of a dirty word in Nashville and had no place outside of novelty. Now, why, why is that? Because... You know, they were, it was becoming a brand and the brand didn't include drums. You know, the, the brand included string band music and that's, mm. and that's where that kind of stayed. But really people like, you know, oh, you know, drums weren't a big part of country music, but really leading up to it. And there's only like this little seven year uh, period where, there was, you know, no drums in country music, which leads me to, um, uh, you know, the bass brush. <laughs> I call this the prohibition era of country drumming. Uh, in the early 50s, the bass, the bass brush was used to reinforce the backbeat along with a sock rhythm guitar in place of the drums. This is where uh, a drum head was attached to the upright bass and the bass player would simultaneously pluck the bass and strike a drum, a drum head with a brush with the same hand. Uh, this is heard on a lot of the early <laughs> Hank Williams, Hank Snow, and Webb Pierce recordings of the era. You know, wow. so I don't know why they were just like they just didn't want to have. I don't know. I, there's really no answer to that question. It's like it's almost hypocritical. Like it's like uh, we don't want drums, but we're gonna do. Nah. We're going to turn the bass player into a drummer. And my immediate kind of like uh, practical thought of my brain goes to like, um, is it maybe one less mouth to feed? One less person to pay in the <laughs> band? I mean, that might be too simple. Yeah. You know, I really, I don't know the full history on like why they, you know, they came up with the, the, the bass brush head. Yeah. Uh, but look it up online. I mean, the pictures of it are super cool. Um, I only know of one bass player, uh, that, that actually does it. <laughs> <laughs> it's so cool. <laughs> to this day. Yeah. yeah. It's a cool gimmick, you know, it'll make you stick out. Man, you know, like for years before, you know, I really do dove into the, the music. Um, I always just assumed that that was a drum on the recording. You know, when you <laughs> yeah. listen to Hank Williams and Hank Snow and, and all the Webb Pierce stuff. Cause like you hear the shuffle pattern and you hear the backbeat, but you know, the, obviously there's no symbol, there's no kick. And you know, it, I guess it could be the sound of the pick on, on the strings, but no, that, it, and then it turns out to be this. And the most famous bass players to do that were Ernie Newton, uh, lightning chance and uh, junior Husky. Hmm. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> That's funny. They almost like they almost classify as like drummers as well. Like they're like 80% bassist, 20% drummer. Ex exactly. And you know, and it's significant enough because that is the birth of the country sound, the classic country sound. So they have to be kind of clumped in with the drummers. Yeah. For sure because they yeah. <laughs> and so you said there was about a 7 year period. So then we get out of this kind of dark ages of the drums and move you know into yeah. the drum set. Mm -hmm. In the mid 50s, a uh, jazz drummer and Nashville native Buddy Harmon developed the country shuffle beat recording with Ray Price. And uh, he did this with a uh, one stick and one brush 
And this became the standard practice for country drumming. Uh, the classic example of this would be on uh, Ray Price's My Shoes Keep Walking Back to You. Um, this method would, would be then applied to the, the shuffle waltz and the 12-8 groove. Yeah, so that's kind of, so now we're moving, they, they're, they're letting the snare drum into the music, but uh, it's it still, it, it emerges into the music, but with a truly unique style, you know, one brush, one stick. It was almost like they were trying to take the whole drum set and put it into the, just the snare, because you can get all those sounds out of the snare, yeah. you know, with the brush having a different texture and then the rim click. Now, when I say one stick, one brush, I don't necessarily mean like uh, a big open backbeat on the snare drum, although that did happen from time to time, but mostly with your standard, you know, rim click. Now, what would that look yeah. like? Like a right, your your left hand would be the stick doing the rim click and your right hand would kind of do the brush kind of like a shuffle or what did that actually like physically, what were they, what were they doing? Your left hand's doing the rim click and your right hand's going so that's basically the very standard of country shuffles got it um you know they they were they were just kind of trying to figure it out you know there was they there like i said before there was no outside of western swing there was no formula and they wanted to come up with something that was truly their own that's awesome you know yeah yeah cool yeah um, but Buddy, Buddy also, you know, recorded with many pop acts, uh, including Roy Orbison and the Everly Brothers. He plays on Kathy's Clown and Pretty Woman, you know. Wow. Um, so, yeah, he, you know, and 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 then Buddy went on to be the first call drummer in Nashville uh, for as a member of the A Team, and 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 ended up playing on a, you know, a great many of country's biggest hits, you know. Uh, so basically, he was a jazz drummer, and his sensitivity to the music gave each tune its own unique drive. Uh, so it may seem that a lot of the grooves sound similar. The art of country drumming is in the details. You know, drummers would create different combinations using you know, two sticks, two brushes, one stick, one brush, leaving the kick out of the A section. The most important thing was to support the tune without distracting the listener from the story of the song. So the story came first. And, and the drummer just had to keep it moving. <laughs> yeah, it's yeah. really cool how the, I think the softer, or like I should say the more uh, nuance you have in your playing, not playing the kick on the first verse, like you said, it's just, it's so mm -hmm. impactful. Then the second that the kick comes in on the chorus or something, then you go, oh, that's what mm -hmm. he's doing. It wasn't there, and now you can feel it. So very, very smart. Yeah, it's, it's a really creative way to have there be a change without there being a change. You yeah, know? Really. It, it, it's subconscious almost. I, 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 I just, I always remembered when I when was younger and listening to country music, I could have swore. I, I mean, it just seemed like the choruses had so much more life and it was just as simple as putting the kick on one and three <laughs> and then dropping it back out again during this, you know, when the verse came back in. <laughs> yeah, really? <laughs> yeah. You have to like fight the urge to not always do, uh, you know, the one and three and the snare on two and four. It's like, just play it cool and sure. You you have to try it yeah. and go nuts to then realize how you know being simple is is really good. Yeah, I mean, but the cool thing about it is, you know, you get to tailor each groove to each song. You know, like to to go with the melody, or if like there's a s specific rhythm in the melody that needs to be emphasized, you can do that with the click. You know, or or like drop a tiny little bomb, the way Gene Krupa would on the bass drum, just to set up like beat two. Yeah, exactly. It's like it's like it's it's like mini, 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 mini big band drumming. Yeah, kind of. That's a great way to put it. Yeah, which makes sense because all these guys that were doing these sessions back then were jazz drummers so it makes complete sense <laughs> you know when you think about it <laughs> yeah it does so jumping on the side here a little bit were they this was all happening in nashville obviously so was that mm -hmm. like the hot spot to be and everyone who wanted to be in this kind of world was moving there to be a country drummer or was it just music in general was happening in there and they're going there to get work well the industry moved to nashville um uh, when they opened up all the studios in Nashville, 
I, when Decca came here at the Quonset hut, uh, and, uh, that's when Nashville kind of started to take off as a, um, the music industry capital, I guess. Got it. Yeah. But I don't think it's, I don't think it was like today where, you know, people were moving here in hordes. I think there were people were coming here, but I don't think it was the way it was today for sure. I also, I, I don't think that there were an abundance of drummers, like, you know, waiting in line, you know, trying to find auditions and stuff to be in bands. But, but, um, but yes, in a lot of ways, this was the place, but country music was popular all over the country at this time. So, you know, yes, Nashville was made, you know, I guess, some would consider it to be the capital and it is the capital, mm -hmm. but you know, it was happening everywhere for sure. Okay, yeah. cool. That's a good, good way to paint yeah. the picture. Yeah. Well, I guess on through the sixties, you know, uh, it wasn't until the mid sixties that drummers started becoming drummers for the sake of, of country drumming. Um, for the first time there was a right and a wrong way to play country drums. Um, Drummers, famous drummers like uh, drummers like Mel King, Willie Cantu, Helen Price, Glenn Davis, Arnie Adams, uh, Willie Ackerman. They all they all had a vocabulary to work with. You know, they they it was, this is what you do. This is how you play country drums. The blueprint had basically been kind of laid out before them, which is it's just cool because it, it hadn't been that much earlier. You know, it wasn't that long before that it was like yeah. decided. It all happened really quickly. I mean, you can say this, I mean, think about the uh, different kinds of music that was happening in the 50s and 60s. I mean, it all happened real quick. Very true. I yeah. think. Yeah. And people were, uh, you know, we keep this current theme keeps coming up of this, that they were making it up as they came along. But around the 60s, you know, they're starting to become like, this is how you play country. This is how you play rock and roll. This is how you play blues. You know, it all started to, find its place. Yeah, you're right, because rock and roll has just been going on. I guess there's more options for people to listen to. Like, I feel like early on, it was like, well, you're going to like jazz, or you're going to like jazz, <laughs> or you're going to like, you know what yeah. I mean? You're going to like big band music. Yeah. Like, you're not having, uh, like now, it's 50,000 different genres of, of every kind of music. So, um, but it's starting to branch out to that more. Sure. And become more uh, nuanced. Yeah. Yeah. But then, you know, in, in the 60s, you know, there were different variations of the country shuffle were being discovered, such as like, I don't even know how to call this group, but I call it the straight eighth country shuffle, which sounds like, it sounds like it, it's, just, it's, it's a, a compound groove. You yeah. Know? Uh, and and this, this groove is, is interesting because it's, it's, it's kind of straight, it's kind of swung, but it almost sounds like a surf beat with the rim clicks instead of an open snare. Um, and this is, I, I don't know if they were trying to compete with rock and roll or what, probably, you know, yeah. but uh, the pioneers of this groove would be you know, Glenn Davis and, and Arnie Adams, who uh, were working with uh, George Jones and Johnny Paycheck. And the best example of that groove is on the song uh, Love Bug. It's just this funny, like it's straight eighth, but it's 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 swung. I I love it. It's one of the, one of the weirder grooves of of all time, but it's so cool. <laughs> yeah, it's uh, it sounds more modern from what I'm just kind of gathering from from not actually hearing that song. But it's like it sounds like like you have to compete, you have to push forward and become yeah. more more relevant than you know to stay to stay hip. And that's kind of what this groove is. Um, and again, just kind of. I think what happened was when you had a singer and he played guitar or, or she played guitar and they had a specific style of strumming, uh, whether it was more strung or more like open fanning of the flat top, like I think the drummer was real, the country drummer back then was real sensitive to that hmm. and would try to lock in with that person's right hand. So if if they if they had a more swung pattern, they played a more swung beat. If they had a straighter thing, they played a, a straighter beat. You know, maybe if they were a bluegrass guy, um, which has its own rhythm, they'd have to kind of uh, they have to go with him. Yeah, or her. Yeah, because otherwise it would be just like a competing kind of mess of of rhythms yeah. at at different times. Exactly. 
Exactly, exactly. <laughs> and then, the, you know, the mid-60s, different influences started coming to Nashville. And this is when uh, the great drummer Jerry Kerrigan moved to Nashville from Muscle Shoals, Alabama. And he brought a blues and R&B influence to Nashville. And uh, he worked along with Buddy Harmon and learned from him. But uh, he went on to, you know, kind of usher in the straight ace era of of uh, country drumming and became, you know, one of Nashville's first uh, call session drummers. Uh, he plays on uh, Behind Closed Doors by Charlie Rich and uh, When You're Hot, You're Hot by Jerry Reed. You, that, that, those are such great tunes. But this is when things start, you know, other influences start coming into the music that's not related to, basically not related to string band music, which is the the base of all of this music. This is when rock and yeah. Yeah. I was going to say like, like what influences, like what's, what's changing. Oh, you know, like we were saying before, you know, jazz, the sound of jazz is changing rock and roll. Now we have the, now we're throwing the Beatles into the mix. Uh, um, you know, just, there was so much music coming on that and people, you know, it, soul music, like I said, Jerry coming, Jerry Kerrigan coming from Muscle Shoals and, the blues and R and B, it all just started to find its way. That's awesome. Um, this brings me to like the uh, now you have the Bakersfield Shuffle in Bakersfield, California. The Bakersfield Shuffle was developed by Willie Cantu, and this this shuffle pattern is a uh, straighter, tighter version of Harmon's Nashville Shuffle, uh, and the, the 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 quintessential example of this is on uh, Buck Owens' Tiger by the Tail. And it's, it's kind of like the normal country shuffle pattern, you know, the... But it's like a... It's just a little straighter. Yeah. It's, it's, it's straighter and swung at the same time. I love it because it wasn't a full-on, okay, now we're going to play straight eight. It was, well... The bass and the kick are kind of playing a lot straighter, and the hi hat from one like two beats to the next sounds a little bit tighter and straight eighthier than the last. And it it's just it's just an interesting little moment. If you listen to country drumming from you know the the fifties through the seventies, you could just hear the the hi hat get straighter and straighter and straighter and straighter until it just becomes, you know, full on straight A, you know, rock drumming basically. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. really. And that's, <laughs> it's kind of funny though, because like the hi-hat kind of has that throughout its history. Like it starts out with just being non-existent. Then it comes in a little bit more. Sure. Then it becomes a timekeeping sort of element. Then it becomes the main, uh-huh. the mainstay of all music. So I, I think, yeah, it's cool how country music For isn't sure. uh isn't exempt from that at all. It's just like the hi hat kind of <laughs> yeah. slips in there and becomes like we all need our hi hat <laughs> to be uh, steady. Well, the hi the hi hat was the main in, the main symbol in the country drummer's setup. You know, they for the longest time they never really crashed a cymbal at, or even would you know like you know it's typical to go to the ride on the B section. Yeah. Now maybe drummers do that today with country music, but back then. You didn't even open up the snare on the B section. You played the same beat and you stopped when there was a stop in the tune and you emphasized that you needed to emphasize and you just played the hi hat and you only crashed the cymbal if it really called for it and if it really meant something or if it really helped tell the story. Interesting. So the hi hat was probably the most important cymbal in, in country music. Wow, that's cool. Because yeah. it's funny because I was yeah. just reading about how. Um, much, much earlier on, but about how, like, uh, Baby Dodds didn't like the hi-hat, didn't want anything to do with it, couldn't play with it. And it's, like, it's so different. I guess <laughs> everyone has their own different uh, – it's it's so many different little yeah. variables in, in, in the different kinds of music. So what are the drum sets yeah. looking like? Um, so we go through – so we're in the 60s now. Is it basically turned into mm-hmm. more of a standard kind of, uh, you know, one high tom, one floor tom, snare – hi-hat crash ride kind of situation or is it anything kind of unique basically hi-hat snare uh rack tom floor tom and a ride and a bass drum no crash symbol 
and sometimes no floor time. I mean, I've seen, I've watched so many videos of the era of, on different live performances and the toms are set up, but I've never really seen anyone hit them. But I always wondered what that was, why those drums were there. And which brings me to this other point is that throughout the 60s, country drumming's Western swing roots remained a very important part of the country music formula. Um, and drummers were given a little bit more room on instrumentals or hillbilly jazz. And a lot of times they would play these tunes to bring the singer onto the stage or to kill time between sets. And this is where the drummer would use those toms. It just so happens that a lot of these videos are of just when the lead singer is out there. So yeah. they're really not using them a whole bunch. Um, and that brings me to one of my favorite drummers of the era, uh, Jack Green. Uh, he was known as the singing drummer. And he was the drummer for Ernest Tubb and the Texas Troubadours. Uh, and they were, you know, country music, but also very steeped in the Western, tra uh, Western swing uh, tradition. And uh, Jack even had his own hit song as a singer, and it was called There Goes My Everything. Uh, uh, and you can hear it as singing, you know, he sings like a drummer. I know you just said that, was, but or he was mainly doing backups in the band that he was playing in, right? No, well, back then in country music, it was, you know, it was typical that there was, you know, a star. Yep. And in this case, that star was, you know, one of country music's greatest musicians of all time, Ernest Tubb. And his band was, you know, all stars of, of their instruments. Uh, you know, one being Buddy Emmons, the great pedal steel player. Um, so the star would come out and sing, you know, their, their songs. And like I said before, in between, they'd let the band do some instrumentals. This was especially the case for the Troubadours, but they'd also let Jack Green sing a few tunes to either bring Ernest on or, or you know, Ernest took a break or something. Um, and this was typical, not just in this band, but um, uh, with George Jones and, and, and so on. Hmm. Yeah. That's neat. You know, it, um, yeah. it kind of makes me think too, I guess it sort of falls in the country uh, category there, but I'm a big Levon Helm fan um, with the band. Oh, sure. And yeah. they're obviously more rock and roll, but have that kind of Southern mm -hmm. rock, even though I think most of them are Canadian. But um, it's cool, though, because he has that – he's a singing drummer who's got a very cool feel, um, obviously mm -hmm. influenced from a lot of these country drummers and musicians. And oh, yeah. And so it, it just it permeated the culture then. Sure. Yeah. And Levon grew up listening to the Grand Ole Opry on the radio when he was a kid. So that makes that sense. A, was a bit, that was a big influence. I mean, he's from, is he from Arkansas? He, where he's from? Yeah, I think I he know. is. Cause I know like Forget. Robbie Robertson and all the other guys, I think they're from Canada. They, yeah. He's the only like, um, uh, yeah. American yes. citizen he's in from the, in the, in the band. He's from Elaine, yeah. Arkansas, born in 1940. That's right. Yeah, that's right. His book, his book, This Wheel's on Fire, uh, talks a lot about how the Grand Ole Opry was a big influence for him. So, yeah, so he definitely grew up listening to these guys. You know, that's a good jumping off point there. So the Grand Ole Opry obviously has a very big influence on a lot of people. And, I mean, I don't know if I'm jumping ahead here, but that is something that has to be talked about. Yeah, oh, definitely. We'll get to that. Okay. Um, well, let's just wrap up the 70s real quick. Absolutely. Um, so, so basically, the, you know, the 60s was a, a time of change in, in, in music and drumming and politically and socially and whatnot. So different influences were making its way all throughout uh, music across the board. But uh, in the late, in the 70s, um, in the late 60s, drummer uh, Larry London moved to Nashville from Motown. And he brought the whole like soul thing to, to, to Nashville. Uh, and now, you know, this is now at this point, the straight eighth groove starts taking, you know, this, the straight eighth groove is, has almost taken place in the shuffle and the toms and the crash symbol become less taboo. Uh, uh, in the seventies, country drumming kind of went disco and a little bit more rock. And they, all of a sudden you're hearing muted toms and uh, stronger backbeat and drum fill and four on the floor and, you know, 
a bigger sound. Sure. Uh, today, this era, this era is referred to as a disco country. <laughs> or on a gig, someone will lean back to you and be like, play the Whalen beat. And they just mean <laughs> kind of play this chunk, this kind of chunky, like it's, it, 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 again, swung straight backbeat. It's, it's like swung disco. I don't yeah. Know how, you know? Yeah. Yeah. That's funny that, that a lot of music in that era, including like you think of bands like kiss, everyone had like their like disco songs. It's like it affected, Sure, but, you, but that's what's popular. Yeah. 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 And country music was no different. You sure. know, uh, as you, as you can see from the beginning of our conversation to now, it moved with the time that it, it, it kept up with what was cool. Yeah. Um, and uh, and disco was no was no exception, I guess. <laughs> <laughs> Unfortunately, or fortunately, depending on what side you're in. But yeah, you, you know, I kind of I kind of love. I I grew up. I mean, my mom was really into disco, so I I kind of grew up loving. Yeah. Well, at least having some sort of soft spot for disco. <laughs> I have no big problem with it. it. It gets hated on a lot, but there's some good songs. You know, it's it's just you know, a con- country drumming disco beat is like, you know, how like it's like a boots boots like that whole thing with the open hi-hat. Yeah. Well, imagine that, but just not opening the hi-hat. That's country. That's the country disco beat. It's like doing the same thing, but without the the opening of the hi-hat. I mean, it's so funny that like four on the floor was basically how drumming started sure. almost always. Yeah. And then it went through this period where it was turned into one and three and variations on that. And then the 70s happened and now it's four on the floor is back and it's way up in the mix and now music sounds the way it does yeah so that's, that's, that's <laughs> yeah it's gone full circle <laughs> <laughs> it has it has and man there's so many other drummers to talk about throughout the you know the history of country music and i i feel bad for whoever i left out because you know a lot of guys like you know kenny malone uh paul english who drummed with uh uh, Willie Nelson and uh, Stuffy Smith, who recorded with Connie Smith, and Richie Albright, who is kind of the the disco country king. He played with Waylon Jennings for the longest time. So there's so many guys. What I always hope is that people can then do further research and kind of look into the bands and and, and uh, artists we're talking about and um, and find out sure. their their own favorite sure. you know musicians to listen to. Sure. Um, but there's just so exactly. many musicians like 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 we spoke on the phone before, but like Elvis, you know, like he's country and he gets into the kind of more rock and roll stuff. But it, people sure. like that who just heavily influence stuff with like DJ Fontana and, and, um, and all these mm-hmm. different drummers who are really mm-hmm. shaping the way a lot of people will grow up and uh, be influenced. Exactly. Yeah. But I guess when it comes to drumming, the, like the under uh, country drumming, the undisputed champion of it is, Buddy Harmon, who we mentioned before. Okay. That's he's good the, yeah, he's the, you know, he's definitely one of the, the big, you know, big names up there with uh, Gene Krupa. You know, he's just like, he's just, you know, he's the quintessential country drummer for sure. Cool. Yeah. He, uh, I just Googled him here. He has yeah. the, he has the look, you know what I mean? There's just like certain people yeah. where you see him and they just embody everything about that, that time. Sure. I mean, he looks kind of rockabilly. He and does. He was a jazz drummer. Yeah. I mean, I mean, but what we consider in 2019 to be rockabilly was just how people dress. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> you know? Yeah. It's all kind of like you got to uh, you got to put that into perspective of like, no, that was not rockabilly. That was just day daily life. Yeah. I mean, I think they only made black Wayfair sunglasses back then. So I'm <laughs> yeah. pretty sure. Yeah. Yeah. Um, <laughs> Only short sleeve button down yeah. shirts that were rolled up with a pack of yeah. cigarettes in them. <laughs> yeah. And 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 jeans only came in one or two lengths, so you just rolled them up. You yeah. Know, that, yeah. But, uh, That's yeah. funny. <laughs> All right. Well, you want to let's talk about the the Grand Ole Opry. Yeah. Bit. Yeah. This is this is the this is the most infamous story surrounding the drums in country music. Uh, it says that drummers had to play behind a curtain. And it's funny, when, when you ask who was the first drummer on the Opry, many say Bob Wills. But the last time I checked, Bob Wills wasn't a drummer. He was a band leader. Hmm. And, you know, one of the most important Western swing band leaders of all time. So it, it doesn't make sense when you ask, who was the first drummer on the Opry? 
Bob Will. Okay. Well, he doesn't play the drums. Yeah, not a drummer. Um, <laughs> not a drummer. Um, and, you know, the Grand Old Opry started in 1925 as a string band show uh, broadcast on WSM to, uh, in Nashville, Tennessee, to rural country folks with no drums. And when Bob Will showed up uh, with the Texas Playboys to play the Opry in 1944, the powers that be refused to let Bob use his drummer. And Bob was a big star, perhaps a bigger star than even the Opry at the time. Now, this was 19, this is the 40s now. We kind of stepped back in time a little bit. Sure. And the story goes that when the Playboys were setting up, the drums were placed in the wings behind a curtain after much discussion. And Bob supposedly yelled out, you know, drag those damn things out here. And they went on to play the show. And that's kind of the lore and legend behind Bob Wills and the drummer on the Opry for the first time. Now, a lot of people give Bob the credit for being the first to use drums on the Opry, but uh, uh, band leader Pee Wee King from the Midwest, he also claims to be the first to use drums on the Opry and that, in fact, Bob Wills was the one that had to play behind the curtain and his drummer didn't. Um, so, you know, this is, and if it was Pee Wee, we're talking, you know, the late 30s and, uh, you know, early 40s. Uh, also, if it was Pee Wee, apparently he was asked to not mention the drums over the air. You know, don't, don't mention that there was a drummer at all. <laughs> Why? Like, why is there such a, uh, I guess it's the tradition, but it's this like, were they, I mean, why, why wouldn't they mention it over the air? Would it just be out of fear of kids growing up to be drummers? <laughs> <laughs> Maybe it was a good thing. I don't know. Yeah. <laughs> um, uh, uh, um, man, I don't know why. Uh, it just, you know, the, yeah. the, the Opry suddenly, the, the Opry suddenly was this big show. And they had a formula that worked, and mm -hmm. it became very popular. And yeah. I just don't think they wanted to mess with that. Yeah, change is scary. Yeah, and that, that formula just did not, you know, include the drum kit. Wow. And the drum kit was a big part of other music at the time, I suppose. But it just wasn't what they thought, you know, with how they saw the, the, the Opry's, I guess, brand, hmm. um, for lack of a better word. Um, and... You know, we don't, and it's funny too, because, you know, we don't know exactly who the first drummer was. It's still surprisingly up for debate. We also don't know what song he played, how many piece drum kit was used, the name of the drummer, or in fact, he did or did not play behind the curtain. So Got it's, it. it's wild. It's and, I, and I've yeah. tried to it's almost like, you know, that famous story of Pete Seeker um, with the axe trying to turn the power off when Bob Dylan went electric. It's, <laughs> it's a similar yeah. sort of, you know, this image of Pete Seeker chopping the power cable. You know, it's kind of the same sort of thing. So the first drummer on the Opry could be Pee Wee's drummer, Harold McDonald, uh, or it could be Bob Wills' first drummer, Smokey Dacus, or Bob's second drummer, Johnny Edwards, or somebody else. We don't know. Man, yeah, wow. We have no, yeah. The timing yeah. of this is kind of interesting, because as you said, other kinds of music obviously had huge, you know, they were drum heavy, and like, you know, you think late sure. 30s, 40s, we're talking like the height of mm -hmm. Gene Krupa being in movies, and Buddy Rich, and it's, this is like, so... It was, this isn't some like very primitive time where there were no drummers. I mean, this was, uh, but country to me, again, kind of looking from the outside, mm -hmm. is very steeped in tradition. Mm -hmm. So I think that mm -hmm. seems like it plays a big part in it. Yeah, but also, I mean, the things you mentioned, Buddy Rich, Gene Krupa, this is urban settings. You know, this is New York City, this is yeah. California. Yeah. That's, you know, this, that's not. Good point you know, rural country folks. Yes. You know. <laughs> yeah. If you're in, and you might not know this, but like if, if I'm a young kid in rural Appalachia, I'm somewhere and I mm -hmm. want to learn how to play music, I guess it would be much more likely that my dad or my grandpa or grandma or mom would have a fiddle or a guitar. 
Sure. Versus having a drum set. So I guess it's also just, it's not readily, there's no music stores. It's not readily available. You, it's probably more difficult to get in. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Maybe your family knew a bunch of tunes that they wrote or they were religious tunes or, um, yeah, as we know, a lot of country music and a lot of blues music are uh, secular words written to, you know, spiritual music. So, you know, that that was passed. I'm sure that was passed down. A lot of ways, the way the drums were passed down in 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 uh, in New Orleans, you know, yeah, uh, you learn from the guy, the, the people who came before you, uh, and you know, there weren't a lot of drum kits laying around in Appalachia. But like we mentioned before. Flat footing, which I don't know if you ever heard flat footing, but it, it's a rhythm. It's almost like tap dancing, and it creates this kind of like rumbly, uh, almost like tap, like I said, but kind of rumbly. Yeah, um, I got gotcha. you. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. And where does yeah. like like I'm probably thinking of like like the washboard or like plain spoons that where oh, does yeah, that sure. fall into this? I mean, because that's that's percussive is that well, just a different category sure. um well not really it's just you know that's more in the i think i would say the country blues um side of things hmm. um i mentioned him before but l watson he plays the bones with the johnson brothers on some uh uh on some tracks and and one this one song the waltz and you really hear you know, the, the country walks to his beginnings in there rhythmically. Um, so yeah, there were different things, the bones, the washboard, I suppose, maybe not so, not as much. I mean, I feel like that may have come later. I'm not, sure, I'm just guessing. No, yeah, yeah. <laughs> sure. yeah, 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 yeah. But the bones, you know, yeah, actually I, 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 I'm, I've been so inspired by the bones that I'm, I'm, I'm in the process of finding my own set um, there's this really cool version, uh, of Alabama Jubilee by, uh, Red Foley. And he has this bones player on it. Uh, Francis Craig, who is a, uh, a kind of a show band leader. I'm not even sure he was a drummer, but he plays on that and it's so cool. And then of course, L Watson, I, I just, it's a, it's a cool, it's a fun thing. It's like a little compact drum kit kind of. Well, yeah, I was yeah. going to say, what are, so what are the bones? Why are they called the bones? What, what's a little more detail? Well, about they're literally, the bones are literally, they're two handheld instruments uh, that, that are literally a bone shaved down to be, and you'd hold two in each hand, uh, similar to the way you would actually hold a chopstick where one is stationary and the other one kind of smacks around it. And it creates kind of a clickety clackety kind of like, Gotcha. Cool. That kind of thing. Yeah. Basically. Yeah. That's awesome. Yeah. So many cool little things. So many things, man. It's it's so funny. Yeah. Um. So yeah. So drums on the Opry. Let's, we'll, let's finish that whole sure, story. Up. Sure. Yeah. Um. Yeah. So you know, drums kind of remained out of sight on the Opry and Hayride and the Louisiana Hayride throughout the '40s and '50s. Um. It said that Buddy Harmon, who we mentioned before, and Harold Weekly had to perform behind a curtain on the Opry, uh, as did DJ Fontana, who we mentioned before, um, on the Louisiana Hayride in the early 50s. And the Hayride was the first to use a full drum kit by 1954, as DJ became a member of Elvis' band. So the drums are starting to make its way onto the Opry. I mean, you know, in more, you know, not about Aubrey, but just into country sure. music. Yeah. So I, I talked to Glenn Davis. Um, Glenn Davis started drumming with the Opry in 1959. Uh, and I asked him about the curtain and uh, he told me that he had never had to play behind a curtain. And he started playing there in 1959. Uh, he also seemed a little bit surprised when I brought it up and he was like, I, I don't even know what you're talking about. Like, what curtain? Really? You know, and this is, this is kind of a famous country drummer. He played, he was a member of the Jones boys. Hmm. I mentioned him before as kind of being the guy, that, one of the guys that created the straight eighth country shuffle. I mean, he, he was like, I, I don't I like, I don't know. I, I read this all the time about the, this curtain. I don't, I don't really know. Um, 
Uh, and he also told me that he remembers going to the Opry in the late 50s, like around 57, and seeing Buddy and Harold on stage. So by, the, by I guess, at least by the late 50s, dr- uh, uh, snare and brushes were officially allowed on stage. Hmm. And then, you know, by the 70s, when the Opry moved from the Ryman to Opryland, they started using the full drum kit. So, yeah, you don't know. But, like, a, a lot of other guys also claim to be the first to use a full drum kit on the Opry. Uh, W.S. Holland with Johnny Cash, he claims to be the very first. Uh, Willie Ackerman, uh, the great drummer, uh, he, they say that he was the first to use the full drum kit with Jerry Reed in 68, which we know is not entirely true. If you, you know, if you take into account Bob Wills and, sure. and Pee Wee, there was a drum kit back then, but then there was this whole chunk. And that whole chunk is from 1944 to 1968, that there was no drums on the opera. <laughs> it's crazy. <laughs> it is crazy. Yeah. But of course people want to, it uh, it's not a bad thing, but like, you know, you, look, no. and, and sometimes your memory really can trick you and go, I think I was the first, like, I don't think they're trying to lie, mm-hmm. but uh, no, <laughs> no, a, a lot of people trying to say they're first. I love that there's just no like actual answer. To this question, <laughs> no, you I, know, and I and I I've talked to a lot of people about it, and they were like, "Man, the best thing to do is just kind of lay out all the facts," and uh, that is the story as to who the first was. It, that you know, it, it's all these facts. Yeah, <laughs> just lay them out and hope people find out. Or we figure it out someday, but uh, that's yeah. basically it. But as far as the drums and the curtain go, I think that maybe it happened a few times or for a while. Um, but I don't think it's as significant as people like to make it out to be. Sure. Um, I have seen pictures of drummers on stage with a snare, but I haven't seen one photo of a drummer playing behind a curtain. Hmm. So interesting. There's that. Yeah. Yeah. And it, would they have multiple shows a day there, or was it just in the evenings, like on the weekends, or what was the... Oh, man. You know, because I'm trying to think, maybe you know, it was t- multiple times. They did it for a week, three times a day, and they were like, just move on to the stage or something, you know? Sh- sure, yeah. I mean, I, I, I probably went... I mean, I've read it in enough books at this point about Buddy Harmon having to play behind a curtain that I would almost say that yeah, it happened. And okay. there's an interview with DJ Fontana where he mentions the curtain and describes the curtain on the Louisiana Hayride. Okay. Um, so they definitely did play behind the curtain. But again, I just don't think it's like that. Who knows? You know, I mean, also the Louisiana Hayride and the Opry, you know, Louisiana, Tennessee. I mean, they were both big country music shows. Yeah, High, happening around the same time that you know that, um, the, the Hayride didn't last as long as the Opry. The Hayride was considered kind of a stepping stone to the Opry in some ways, although I'm sure a lot of people would not, you know, wouldn't like that very much. But um, so yes, we don't know. But I've read it enough to say, okay, there was a curtain. Who was the first to use the curtain? I don't know. Who was the first drummer in the Opry? We don't know. Um, yeah, all I know now is that the the drums are fully embraced, uh, with many tom-toms and many cymbals and even a second (laughs) snare drum. Yeah. Um, Now it's just all bets are off and it's just like, it's a, it's hard to differentiate from rock drumming to arena. You know, I mean, now things are are huge and it's, it's, uh, it's the level playing field for everyone. Sure. And that's, you know, and that's why, you know, after the seventies and country drumming as, as rock uh, started, you know, seventies rock and sixties rock, I think is significantly different. Right. Yeah. So the sensibility, the sensibility that was then brought to other styles of music to compete with that, you know, changed the way drum sound changed the way the volume of the band, um, and, you know, took out a lot of subtleties. It wasn't about subtleties. It was about power and, and volume and moving forward. Sure. Um, yeah. yeah. The same thing goes for country drumming. Cool. All right, Maddie. Well, why don't you tell us, uh, why don't you tell everyone where they can find you and just talk a little bit about you and um, how they can keep up with you online and check out gigs you're doing and all okay. that good stuff. 
Great. Yeah, man. Um, well, um, I have my own little website, uh, mattymeyer.com, um, and you can find out where I'm playing with or who I'm playing with and working with. And um, I've been kind of just sticking around Nashville mostly these days, playing, uh, you know, gigs and doing session work, um, hitting the road a little bit here and there. Um, you know, for years I played with Pokey Lafarge, and, and that that gig was, uh, I got to say, that, that was a, you know, that was kind of a challenge too, because it was, you know, Western swing, one song would be polka, one song would be, yeah. you know, rock or soul. And it, it was a real nice mix of all the stuff. And, and I've always been in love with that. So, you know, I, I, I play a lot of, I get called to do a lot of gigs where it's Western swing and jazz and, and uh, traditional rock and roll and rockabilly and kind of all the dead genres, sure. so to speak. So, so yeah, you know, I, I, on Instagram, um, um, my uh, Instagram name is Maddie Meyer Drummer. Uh, you can see where I'm playing around town. And um, yeah, just to, that's about it, basically. <laughs> cool. I'm really glad to have you here because obviously you're a younger guy working in the world of uh, music. And you have a clear appreciation and um, kind of a thirst for knowledge for the world of music that you're living in, which is country um, of all the varieties. Yeah. So I think that's really important that you know what you're doing and the history of it. Well, thanks, man. I, I, I've been enjoying it so far, and I hope to keep on. Well, thanks for taking the time to talk to us today, and uh, I recommend everyone goes and finds Matty Meyer on uh, social media and his website and all that good stuff. Matt, thanks, man. Thanks for having me, Bart, and keep up the good work. Talk to you soon. All right, bye. Bye. If you like this podcast, find me on social media at Drum History, and please share, rate, and leave a review. And let me know topics that you would like to learn about in the future. Until next time, keep on learning. This is a Gwyn Sound Podcast.